Russell, it's so good to have you back. <laughs> it seems like uh, yes. it seems like our conversations, uh, which I thoroughly enjoy and I've learned a heck of a lot from, just doesn't seem to want to stop. And I'm I, I feel um, excited, you know, excited for this conversation and excited for what's to come beyond this. Um, how have you been, by the way? Just quickly. Yeah, it's been interesting. It's been uh, good times. It's always nice times when, uh, you know, I've been on a form of sabbatical. So during this learning period, uh, being introspective is always a good thing for me. I value that highly. So um, a lot of insightfulness that flows from there. And so therefore in a good space, in a good space. Uh, How have you been? It's been quite a while since the World Cup. So yes. what's been happening? Yeah, yeah, lots have been happening. I've been sitting on the other side of the world a little bit, uh, a bit of holiday checking out the cricket scene there in the US and um, at this point in time, uh, back in South Africa and ready to keep rocking and rolling like we have been, you know. Um, so, so, so today, you and I are just going to chat a little bit about the South African women's team, right? We've noticed a couple of things there in this World Cup in a conversation that you and I had uh, sort of last week. Um, I just thought we'd share a couple ideas and at the same time, use this as a bit of an introduction for some more conversations that you and I are going to be busy having um, going forward. And, and, and those conversations really excite me, in particular about changing the way cricket is being played. Um, maybe I'll just leave it at that for now. Um, but yeah, really, really excited for that. In terms of the South African women's team, what have you sort of noticed? Like what has stood out for you there? Um, in terms of the things that you saw, maybe based on some of our other conversations we had and what you see is the same or not the same or different. Yeah, thanks, Jody. Uh, you know, I haven't followed, to be admittedly, I haven't followed the, the women's campaign. I think you're referring to the World Cup campaign that's just been. I haven't followed that intensely. But, you know, obviously... The hype that's come as a result of them beating Australia in the semi-final and then um, and then getting into the final again, subsequent finals that they've been into now, so back to back finals. And I think um, just on the media hype and uh, you know the a lot of articles and video posts and people kind of wishing them well, it kind of got me looking and watching the game actually because it was perfect for us in South Africa, uh, the game being on a Sunday afternoon. So I did watch the final, and, and that kind of intrigued me. So, as I said earlier, I haven't watched prior to that, but uh, having watched the final, this really is my take on um, what I would like to share today is my take on how, you know, a little bit of sadness, obviously, in terms of how the result and how the game unfolded for South Africans, but also not just for the conventional way that we didn't just get to win it. We didn't get to bring the trophy back home. That's not the sadness for me. The sadness is really the repeat of what I see is happening with the men's game uh, as well as with the women. Um, and the sense of white knuckling, trying to, you know, force this victory to come our way and the desperation to have the cup lifted on our end. That really, for me, is the saddest indictment. Um, and it's a repeat, really, of what happened with the men's. Um, and I know we have been, we spoke a lot about it in our series, lifting the covers. So it just seems to be very much going across to the women as well, you know, and, uh, but there are a lot of good things that's come as a result of it. But I think firstly, that for me is the biggest thing. It's that sadness that comes as a result of the way they've actually uh, fell short. And secondly, the reasoning behind why they fall short for some of the reason they don't necessarily um, understand the shortcomings, you know, and I think maybe if we can dwell a little bit into that, we might be able to shed a little bit of light that creates a little bit of comfort for those who are currently shattered and again, heartbroken, disappointed as a result of this supposed um, falling short at the last hurdle. Yeah, yeah. I mean, same, right? I think we we put in so much effort in the <laughs> into the men's World Cup. Um, I didn't necessarily follow this World Cup all the way through, but was sort of aware because there's one of the cricketers in the national team. I haven't I haven't spoken with her uh, at all, 
um, but did a bit of work with her um, earlier in the year and sort of, the, you know, I have a vested interest in her and how she does. And so I've been sort of following along. But what has been noticeable for me, I mean, I read through a couple of articles in preparation for this. It's, it is very much similar storyline, similar approach, uh, similar... I don't know, similar everything really to the men, you know, that's, that just plays out. Um, one, one of the things I read in an article that um, the South African cricket team, team maybe needs this more than the New Zealand cricket team, you know, and then the article sort of starts with how New Zealand are set up better as a country where we are fighting poverty, 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 sorry, and we're fighting crime and all of these things in our country where they're not. And so that's why we need the win. Well, we need the win because we've got corruption and hardships and, you know, we've got the struggle here in South Africa. And I think we, uh, we spoke about that quite a lot, right, um, at the start. And our country's history, I think Kukuleko um, sort of joining us in some of these conversations earlier around our history and the impact that has on our sport. And, and, and to me, I don't know, I, I feel sad that it feels like we're not able to move beyond that. It's not to discount that. It's not to say that those things didn't happen or that they don't matter or that the effect it had on people's lives, et cetera, et cetera, is not important in some way. But I think if we under, for me, if I think of performance and how performance happens and my understanding of that, that performance doesn't care about that stuff. It doesn't really, right? Performance doesn't care whether you, whether you slept well or didn't. Performance doesn't care whether you have the right slogan. That's another thing I noticed. We, we have these slogans, you know. Africa, To now the new one is uh, RSA. Uh, uh, yeah, RSA, not DNA. Um, you know, and there's a place where Paul Adams uses that as an example. Like that's that's what we're about, and so it, it it just keeps sort of talking to this idea that we don't know who we are yet. We don't know what our identity is. Like you know, it's just a rehashing of all these themes that we've spoken about sort of before. You know, what's your? Yeah, and I think the narrative. No, you go. Yeah, I think I think the narrative is is definitely repeating itself, and uh, we've kind of bought into the idea that we need to do something almost miraculously or something special at these events. So we're constantly looking for these superheroes, so to speak, whether it's men's, women, or even the fighter you're referring to, you know, the Vietnamese, Vietnamese, that you know, to kind of spark the sense of enthusiasm and inspiration. And as a result of it, then it's going to address all of our problems, supposedly. Yes, the realities are there are concerns in South Africa. There are definitely concerns. But how does those victories actually translate into changes that's going to be made on the ground? That's not necessarily a true thing. I mean, I know South Africans, we, we tend to be quite vocal when it comes to certain things. But we've got to be realistic about it. You know, if if, if success is going to impact and have such a dynamic change on the ground in South Africa. It hasn't really been the case. We're going to need to drive the change in those contexts apart from sport. We can't keep blanketing or covering up and pretending that sport's going to do that for us. We're going to have to do that ourselves on the ground day in, day out, wherever we are in sectors in life. Sport is something that's separate, but we bought into this narrative that sport is playing the part to change the status quo and to change the game. It's not, it's not, when I say the game, I'm talking about societal game, the, the, the ills or the impact of what's happening in our society, maybe the unequal society or, or the murder rate or whatever, the, the poverty, all those inequalities. It's not going to be addressed from sport. It's just going to spark an enthusiasm for the moment. But sport can't necessarily drive that. It can actually alleviate some of the pressure that we have to experience day in and day out, the tensions of, the, of those disparities. But it's not going to be the change agent to that. And I think we bought into that narrative that, call it the lie or the fallacy, that sport can do that. And it, it can't. It's too heavy of a burden to actually go with that into um, whatever competing environment and then think that that is going to be a heavy enough or, or sort of weighty enough to drive us to peak performances. It can't be. 
you know, and, and I think it's unfair to do that. But we've kind of sold, we've been sold that, call it uh, the belief uh, from the 95 World Cup onwards already, that our sense of rainbow nation realities are going to be birthed out of winning a Rugby World Cup. Now we've got four World Cups, as we said before, and yet we haven't had major changes on the ground in terms of society reforming or transforming. Even our, our current uh, flagship face of unification has now been dismantled recently with their announcements in Sia Colisi and Rachel Colisi, right? Um, their personal lives are currently a little bit uh, dismantled in a way. And, and success hasn't actually managed to keep them together. And I'm not trying to go into their personal lives here, but my point is just because you have success at the highest level doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have success personally or on the ground in your day to day in a country. So we can't bring that correlation between the two and say that it's directly impacting one another. We can definitely have a part to play in inspiring and encouraging and maybe bringing a little bit of enthusiasm or light to each other by doing that. But it's not the driver and the answer to all these things. And yeah. I think that there is what we have to be real, real about. Uh, and the women, unfortunately, fell into that same trap like the men's or like we're all kind of wanting to do. Just please win so that we feel like winners. We have to feel like winners already and address these things on the ground and then allow our sport to just be an expression of our existing, call it uh, grit, our existing perseverance that we have. Uh, and we demonstrate that, not the other way around. We can't demonstrate it there and then decide to say, you know, um, this is who we are on the Vietnam buttons, Vietnam, and now we must go contend, you know, with our day to day. <laughs> it seems a little yeah. bit odd, but yeah. that's also part of the sad indictment that we were speaking about. Like, why do we buy into that? Why do we surrender to it? We must question it a little bit, and I think we can maybe change it and maybe have a different experience, not as heartbreaking, not as shattering, not as dismantling as it has, you know, when, when things fall apart. You just look at that. I mean, you had glimpses when you put up our last image when uh, Miller, sorry, I'm being a bit long-winded, but I apologize. Uh, you know, oh, Miller, but... Clark, and uh, I think who was in the picture, I can't remember who else. Uh, you know, they had an image of, of the guy. But these pictures, why does it have to have that sort of impact? You have a, a, a hundred class and who seemingly is winning the game and then loses a sense of, you know, a moment in the game and then the game is gone, right? And then after that, he admits that he is burnt out because the impact of that loss is so dramatic on him that he couldn't go and continue playing, you know. And it is a heavy tournament. It is a weighty, demanding tournament. So I can understand the energy you need to require to start a new tournament, right? But it doesn't have to be so debilitating that for months we don't see him. And then he resurfaces, having kind of needed, needing to recover and, re you know, recoup himself again almost like he lost something like a lost a limb or some sorts right does it have to be that dramatic i don't think it needs to be and if we really look at it maybe we can reframe it to be more empowering than as disempowering as it currently is yeah yeah i mean i i to, to maybe just sort of vibe off what you're uh, expressing there this whole idea of um uniting uniting the nation. I think you said it beautifully, right? So I'm stealing your words earlier when you and I were sort of prepping for this. That we are united already. The moment we maybe realize just that simple fact, like why does 14 people with maybe a support staff of 10 or whatever, let's call it 30 people, why do they want to take on themselves the burden uh, of feeling like they want to unite the country? Because it only speaks it presupposes that we're not united yet. That's essentially what it presupposes. And, and these 30 people are now going to bring us together. Well, like you said, Rugby World Cup after Rugby World Cup has happened. And we're still not united. So maybe we're looking for unity in the wrong place. And we're claiming the importance of our sports people to uh, bring a sense of unity. We're, 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 we're sort of um, making it overly... overly more difficult than it needs to be instead of just going out playing a cricket game um you know and if, if i think of the women's team it seems like they've had a lot of challenges their head coach quit five months before the world cup the assistant coach 
Dylan Dupree took over, it seems like he was reluctant to do that. It didn't seem like it was something that he really wanted to do. And like some of the, I read an article about that and it seems like I always want to take my hat off to him. You know, he's not claiming the limelight and saying, yes, I've got this job. But he's like, no, I almost like, no, I'm not good enough at this. And it seems like they spend some time talking about that and, you know, the insecurities that he has maybe around that, but also the team, right? So I think that's sort of good leadership that maybe opens up an avenue to say, right, we need to just step back and realize where we're at and take some stock. And uh, maybe I'm not the strongest leader yet. Technically, I'm really strong, but I don't know if I'm head coach material quite yet. But this is where we're at. This is what we're going to do. CSA is going to give us some extra support staff, which they did. And so I think in that in that sense, like freaking awesome, right? And maybe. If you think of the national team, they lost a lot, the women's team. They lost something like eight series or seven series before the World Cup. Um, but at the same time, maybe it empowered those players to take more ownership because they weren't so reliant on the head coach, which I think is a positive thing because often we make the head coach the thing when it's actually the players that they must step into a space of feeling like they're in the team and they're running the team and they can make their own decisions, you know, maybe with having a head coach that's uh, not as authoritative and not so like such a big person I'd saying, I know I'm going to pull us in a direction. It allowed the players to actually step up and claim their space a bit more. And maybe that's one of the reasons they made the final again, because before the world cup, I wouldn't have thought that they'd get that far to be perfectly honest yet. They did. And sort of thinking about it afterwards, I'm like, well, maybe that's one of the reasons. There might be more, you know. Um, again, did they peak a little bit too early? They, 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 they played a great game against Australia, essentially knocking out the people who everybody thought was going to win. That was their final, really. Um, and so maybe that just took too much out of them. And then they loaded more meaning on top of it because now we've got to go unite a country instead of saying, no, we are united. We're like, if you want to unite a country, you have to be united first. If you're united as a team, sorry, my head's just thinking here, right? I'm playing this through my brain. If you're united as a team, in that team is different races, different colors, different religions, uh, men as part of the support staff, female, and who, you know, every, every other sort of orientation potentially in between. I don't know much necessarily about that, but they seem united, right? So if you're united, you're a microcosm of South Africa. We can essentially be like that. In fact, we are like that if we just realize it. And then go play, not to unite, but just to go play to be the best that we can be, to go play and be able to shift our focus to the... It, it still stays my favorite, favorite performance sort of talk thingy slogan sentence whatever you need to call it to be the ability to focus on the right thing at the right time and i think if you bring all sorts of rubbish with you into performance you do not allow yourself to just focus on the right thing at the right time so if i'm worried about uniting a country and i'm worried about doing this now all of a sudden for a whole bunch of people when leading up to the final all i did was sharpen my skills focus on being present, showing up as my best self, being clear to make good decisions and off we go. And all of a sudden comes final, we change things and we bring more things into it. Then we diminish our ability to focus on the right thing at the right time. Also the, just, you know, as you just said, now, all the focuses might need to be the right thing at the right time, but, but also the underlining mishap that you don't even see, the subtle mishap in that, you're attempting to get something that you already have, you already are. So how do you get something and how do you be persuaded that you need to go and achieve something or grab for something that you already are? It's almost an impossibility. And it's also a statement of, of lack, in a sense, of that you don't have. So therefore, you're wanting. So all you're going to get is the experience of wanting this thing that is seeming to ev well, forever elude you. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's a little bit... Uh, Silly to go after something that you already are. It's like a kid that's trying to perform, and I use this metaphor a lot. A kid that's trying to perform, look daddy, look mommy, you know, look at me. Uh, I'm a superstar. 
you're already that, but now you need to perform or put on a show to kind of convince them that you're something, that you already are something, right? You don't have to convince. As soon as you convince, it says you're not, you're not fully persuaded yourself. So therefore, um, you second guess yourself and then you fall short. You've already been the victor or you already are the special one, if you want to call it that, right? You already accomplished something. So then you just go and be it. When you're kind of grabbing for something that you already are, you're actually announcing that you're not sure if you're that already. And I think that's where the thing gets further and further away from and they'll never get it. So what they tend to do is in the narratives, and I think you were alluding to it with the leadership, is, is saying, listen, we've worked so hard, we've deserved this, so let, as a consolation, let us pat ourselves on the back and saying, we've come from a major series losses into this tournament, didn't really have any fair chance. And now that we've managed to get into the final, which in and of itself is the major achievement, as you said, we've won the, um, the, the defending champions. And then we kind of change the energy, right? And now it becomes this desperate grab for something, um, you know, bigger now, right? This, this bigger sense of thing. And as a result of it, um, we lose our way. We lose our way. But the, the whole thing is about the celebration of who we are all the way through that. So now this angst to make it happen kind of allows us to implode in a way. As a contrast, by the way, they are a already united group, as you said, if you just look at it physically, visually, all right? They're very much united. So all they needed to do was just to go out there and continue to do the proud things that they've always been doing. We have been able to applaud them instead of saying, no, just bring the cup back. Now we're going to be proud of you. We're already proud of you. And that's enough. No, you don't have to put on a show. Just be yourself. Uh, I continue being who you are, you know. But now with that pressure of needing to bring the cup back and all of that, look look what happened to the New Zealanders. The New Zealanders look more like calculated or kind of, they look more together. They look more to, when I'm not talking as a team, I'm saying more composed. They look more settled in their approach in that final. There wasn't any sense of frantic energy to kind of convince themselves that they, could be champions. They were in the final loss in 2010. That was the last time. And they lost two in a row. It was, I think, 2009 and 2010 or whatever years it was. I can't remember the years now. But it was two successive World Cups that they lost, right? And they lost heartbreakingly at, like, you know, very tight games. And those same players, or at least two or three of the same players, were in this very team now. And it was possibly... Their swan song, their last games, right? Their last World Cups in particular. They didn't have the angst that we had as some of our older players who felt like, if it's not now, it's never. And I'm going to feel less than as a result of if I don't get this. In case in point, probably Marazan Cup is an example. Down in tears, mean so much, all of those sorts of things. If, if your object of desire is so intense, you can't necessarily have that peak performances. As the contrast, if you look at the ladies, uh, the captain of the New Zealand team and their opening batter, those are senior states ladies, right? Senior ladies are, are in that team. They just played with a sense of, we know what we're all about. We know our game. We're just going to go about what we've always been doing all the years, despite having lost way in 2010, which is more than a decade, a decade and a half ago almost, right? And we're just going to do this thing because at the end of the day, this is a celebration for me. It's my penultimate or ultimate, my last leg of the World Cup. And whatever comes our way, comes our way. And, and that's how they received it. They received it in such gracious manner. The cup was awarded to them ultimately. There was actually a moment in the game. I don't know if you remember the name here. Sorry, man. I, I'm very poor in terms of the names of the females here. But that opening lady... The opening batsman of the New Zealanders. If you can recall a name, it will be useful to mention it. Susie Bates. That's right. So Susie Bates also has a few catches in that match. And she takes some brilliant catches in, in cover. In, on the cover kind of fielding position. And the sharp chances. And she takes it effortlessly because all the while she's just doing and going about the thing. And then there's a moment in the game where the ball gets skied and is very close to the bowler. And she forces away, kind of, you know, frantically running, wants to take this because it's going to be like a third or a fourth catch or whatever, right? And all of a sudden, she drops that one, right? Obviously, there's an obstruction with her. But it just shows if you have a different approach or energy or desire and something shifts, 
You're not taking those sharp chances. You're not taking the catches that you can always take. You drop dollies because you now desperately want to make it into a spectacle. And I think that's the, that's the kind of uh, trap we fell into as South Africans again. Imagine what this is like, the enchantment of winning this thing and bringing this cup back and being the first team to do it for South Africa and we will be hailed as heroes and our people are going to be proud of us. We're going to unite people, all of those things. And a lot of it is actually not true, but they got built up this energy, built up this enthusiasm for that. And the delight of that desire is the thing that eventually crippled them, right? This aura of what it could be. And I think that's the thing that kind of suffocated them ultimately, because the more it slips away from them, the more they're like, oh my goodness, this dream of what we could do for everyone is dissipating. But what is the motive behind actually achieving that cup? That's the key. Why do you want to win this cup? And is this thing that you're saying, Truly, the reason, is it real that you're saying it's to unite or if it's to make my people proud or is it more self-adulation? You want to be seen as this big champion. You want to end your career in a certain way or you want to be a, you know, a special one because you're going to be one of the first. What is it that drives the desire? Is it a little bit deceitful? Is it something that's maybe misplaced? You know, what is that desire? to actually obtain this thing. That's very much elusive. But maybe it's elusive because you need to be very much playing from the right spirit in a very mature fashion. You need to be walking worthy of it, as we spoke about, and be worthy of receiving it, which I felt that the white ferns have played according to that spirit, they have played according to that kind of mechanism of, no, we've walked the hard yards, They've lost 10 out of 10 on the bounce themselves and come into this tournament and then just gracefully received the cup and then gave the send-off to the Susie Bates. And I think the captain is also, they gave sense of honor to her as well. So, so that was so beautiful to watch. If you're watching the game with no attachments and no aversion, then you can appreciate those things and you can applaud your position and saying, the glory needs to go to you because you played a game that was worthy, call it of, of the spirit of the game, right? It was beautiful to watch this final. But if you sabotage it then because you got selfish ambitions, if you want to call it that, you know, ulterior motives behind this thing, I think that's the thing that cripples you and makes you fall on the hurdle, right? Because you're not necessarily ready to receive the crowning glory. And therefore you cover too much this cup for like sort of my precious and you're going to actually cause yourself to actually become a little bit, uh, yeah, it's not going to be pretty. You're not yeah. going to be a pretty recipient yeah. of that cup. Yeah. No, I mean, you make, you make a lot of sort of valid points that I've made some notes here. One of the, one of the um, things that I'm sort of really, really mindful of that I, I'm going to say this because I feel like this is now the next evolution of this thing. Now it's been labeled as a curse. First, we were chokers that couldn't make finals and couldn't win. And I, I, I get the sense, and we sort of echoed it in our conversations, that maybe that tag isn't necessarily that relevant to us anymore. We're playing good games of cricket in World Cups. We were, we're losing games because we're losing games. And yeah, there's some of the old still sitting there. We get into winning positions, and that might still be choke-like to a certain extent. But certainly the men in the World Cup had a lot of tough games and they, they were on the lucky side of the draw or they pulled it off or whatever that might have been. But it seems like this, this is going to be the next evolution of it, is that now this is a curse that we carry with us, right? And so it's the next label that the next generations of cricketers in South Africa would have to learn to overcome, is that we are now carrying some... It's, so it's almost like we always have to carry some extra baggage with us. You know, first we carried the choker tag, now we'll carry the curse. It feels like the only way South Africans can ever be freaking good at anything is if we feel like we're up against something. We feel we've got our backs against the wall. Then it's worthwhile to show up and perform. Versus just saying, I'm showing up and performing because I want to show up and perform. <laughs> I'm, I'm playing because I love playing the game. Like that is that like from a mental performance point of view, it's a fundamental basic 
idea that you bring to your performances, if you can show up to play the game for the love of playing the game, whether it's a final or whether it's a game down your street for your club, it is, to me, it is a foundational building block. It's like a cornerstone block. If you haven't got that block in place, everything else gets derailed in some way. Everything else gets affected positively or negatively in some way. And so, you know, I feel like what we do with these World Cups is we don't show up just to play for the love of playing the game. We care too deeply. We care too much about the wrong things. Meaning, we care too much about that it's the struggle in our country. We can, and those things are important, but they're not important when it comes to a World Cup to play, to win a World Cup. They're not. You know, like they, they, they should be your inspiration that you carry with you every single day in every single, single thing you do to make a difference in your community, wherever you are, not the difference you want to make when you stand on the world stage. That should be the pinnacle of that, yes, but it should be something that's alive in you because otherwise you, you're arriving there with a falseness, with an inauth inauthenticity. If you want to really unite the country, then you're uniting the country when you walk and talk on the floor. And I do know, I, certainly I knew, know one of the women cricketers in the South African cricket team that, that is like that. That is her, her authenticity. She walks and talks that in the little bits that I've had to deal with her. Um, and, and she's not a client. I was involved with a woman's team and I sort of just noticed it. Like, I don't know, maybe, maybe all of them are like that. I don't know, maybe I'm making an assumption. But if, if, you, if you're not arriving authentically with that sort of in you, then I think to put on that mask is only going to hurt you come World Cup time, right? And so I, I'm, I'm sort of curious for the last little bit in our conversation, what do you think? Cricket South Africa, the Proteas, the women's national team. I don't know if they also called the Proteas. I don't know if they just called the SA women team or if they've got some different name, to be, to be honest. Um, what do you think we must actually do with this? Like, what, what is the solution? What is the actual, or maybe, maybe it's not the actual solution, but what could be a different path that we could try? Because clearly this isn't working, right? Um, it's, it's wishful and it's hopeful. And maybe we can wish ourselves into a winning position. Who knows? There's more World Cups coming and maybe all these conversations are uh, falling on deaf ears and, you know, we've got it completely wrong. Maybe they're evolving. Maybe. I don't know. But if, 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 you, if we could sort of just theorize or thumbsuck for a moment, what could be a solution that could help bridge the gap between the chokes and the curses and the struggles and the unity and all of these things and actually just going there and playing and winning. Loving the, loving the conversation around the ladies in particular, because I have no sense of attachment one way or the other to the ladies. I hardly watch it. So it's, it's so nice because I'm, I'm just, I'm detached completely. Right. But what I am going to say is from a space of compassion, because I, I do not understand why we would keep wanting to place such misery on ourselves, such much fortune and such heartbreak consistently when we are not evaluating the feedback in the right manner. It really is if we look at something that's causing us pain consistently and not addressing it in the proper fashion. We, this is why I'm saying it's a, it's a compassionate way of saying it. I'm, I'm really much saying that we miss reading the feedback that we're getting. What's going to happen here is most likely Cricket South Africa would be saying, you know, guys, never mind, you didn't get to win. You didn't get to bring the World Cup back, but you guys are going in the right direction because this is your second World Cup. Um, and all you need to do is find more resources and make you more prominent and keep show showing support to you one way or the other physically mentally, whatever, throw more support towards you. And you must double up on your efforts, work harder, work smarter, and then go at it again. So eventually, but what they're basically saying is keep becoming hungry and hungry and hungrier for it. But they're not actually going down to the core of what is the root of that desire inevitably, because we're not answering that. Why do you want this thing to be a measurement of success? What exactly is the deep-seated root 
of why we want the success. Because ultimately in South African context, we had uh, sport as a narrative for revolutionizing our country. So if we're still going on that, but we're using it now as the success, whether it is Olympic success, so many medals, and so therefore we want to say we are a winning nation, but we're losing day in, day out. We need to stop covering up pretenses and address the things on the ground where they are happening and stop pretending that sport's going to be able to do that. Sport has its part to play, but we've got to be real in, in, in the way we do it. So the feedback should be, if we are not getting the success, why are we not getting it? Is it too much of that burden to be placing on our shoulders? It's, let's, you know, feedback is feedback for a reason, right? In the word, it gives you the, the kind of sign of what it's meant to do. You're supposed to feed off it, which means it's supposed to benefit you in moving forward. So if it's negative, it means you're not quite ready to receive the cup because there's certain things that unknown to yourself is not ready for you to be a worthy recipient to carry the glory of this cup. Whereas I felt at this point in time, as you said earlier, maybe we are supposedly deserved winners. I don't necessarily think so. I don't think we're mature enough and we're going to pe pretend that we are if we were to have received it. As un, you know, it's not really nice to hear, but it is the reality because it didn't happen. Whereas the Susie Bates, was worthy to take it because at the pinnacle of her career, she seems to be more mature to be able to sustain the success that will come with or the glory that will come with it. You know? And they'll be able to use it because they are first world nation. So they'll be able to use it in such a way that they're not going to turn it into something that's idolatrous in a way, that this is going to cover up a whole bunch of other things that need that needs to be uncovered and addressed on the ground. So as a result of it, from a space of compassion, I'm saying there is more to this deeper down that the individual players and the system needs to ask themselves, what are we doing that we can tweak instead of just giving the, the normal narrative of saying, uh, no, let's just try harder next time. The next uh, event is coming up so many months down the line or 12 months or a year or two years. Let's prepare for the next and the next and the next. And we keep doing the same thing. And obviously we know that's the definition of insanity. Because at the end of the day, we are hurting people along the way and scarring people along the way persistently because we are not taking that feedback in the right manner. And it really is about the corruption of the desire. The desire is being corrupted because we are not placing the desire in itself is pure. But we need to be able to kind of look at it more closely and saying, how do we purify it to becomes clear for us? So that the desire and the hunger is pure instead of an agenda-based desire, and therefore we are falling short of it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take those. A... Those. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, I'm just saying that those, those are the spaces of contentment, where you know the. You would understand this from a mental coaching point of view, where you're coming from a, a place of strength, where you have concepts like the rich getting richer type of scenario. And I'm not talking about in terms of worldly riches or those sorts of, uh, call it spiritual connotations. I'm talking about if you're already rich, more riches flow towards you. If you're already full, more fullness flow towards you. We shouldn't feel less than. We need to be winners already and winners win. It shouldn't be something that must be a major effort, right? The grass doesn't struggle to grow. The grass just grows. Birds don't struggle to fly, they just fly. So likewise, we shouldn't struggle to play cricket and add any additional things. We must just play. We must liberate ourselves. And that's the point. We must play in the right spirit, pray with freedom. Right now, the spirit in which we're praying is off and it is burdening and shackling us and shattering us when we don't get the objective because we don't have the right spirit. And that's what needs to be investigated. And just to be blanketly and saying, you know, well done, we are proud of you, you didn't make it this time, but double up, next time you can do it. It's not going to be the answer. We need to be a little bit more introspective. We need to be a little bit more wiser because we are hurting each other unnecessarily, and it can be avoided. We can help, you know, we can help each other to get to that truth. Yeah, brilliant. I, I, I'm going to um, sort of bounce off your ideas there and just add one or two things. Now, uh, when you speak about the desire and what it is that we're seeking, 
I think it can be very easy to think that my sense would be, right, based on our conversations and sort of my, my sense of where the cricket system here in South Africa is at, the primary desire, and we might try and fulfill this desire by looking for it in other places. But I think the primary desire is the desire of identity. It is, it, that, is, that, is, that remains for me the biggest thing that needs to be solved, um, is the who are we answer, you know, question, right? Because if the answer is we can't see ourselves as winners because we haven't won yet and we're trying to define who we are based on our performance, based on our successes and failures, then we're seeking for the answer to that question in the wrong place, or we're trying to generate the answer to that question in the wrong place. Um, if we're seeking for it in slogans, you know, if we're seeking for it in uh, things that are external to the human being, the human consciousness, if we're seeking for the answer to that on the outside of us, that is where the problem lies. The, that to me is the primary problem is that, you know, we, we've got some slogan and then that makes us feel good. We've got, um, we, we, we can sort of, if we only feel united and inspired. Un unity, the, a sense of unity is a feeling that you have on the inside of you, right? That feeling, if it's attached to something on the outside, if the thing on the outside doesn't happen, you never have the feeling. Where I can generate that feeling and the understanding in my consciousness and then from that place, deliver my performance, right? And so, we spoke about being, doing, having, right? And, and so just, it's that same idea for me, is that that identity, the beingness needs to be, needs to be solved and it needs to be cultivated more consciously than it is. Um, and then the second part of this, and this has maybe got nothing to do with mental performance and it's got nothing to do with, well, I wouldn't say it's got nothing to do with mental performance. I think it's got everything to do with mental performance, but and, and it's maybe contrary to some of the stuff you and I spoke about. Contrary in the sense of, in South Africa, we have this very much this let's go work hard philosophy, right? I like to counter that idea with let's become insanely good. Like insanely good. Because if you, if you want to win World Cups to eradicate doubt and to eradicate sort of low confidence or whatever, the, 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 the most surefire way to do that is by establishing what I like to call like a sense of knowing. And the only way you can know something is by becoming insanely good at it. It is so part of you. It is so true for you. It's like if I said to you, Russell, what's the color of your skin? You're not going to say to me, I believe this is the color of my skin. You're going to say, I know I'm a colored. I'll say, I know I'm white. <laughs> right? And, and so when I speak about becoming insanely good, it's about cultivating that, that deep level of knowing within our cricketers about how and and then that at every level right but in particular around skill because often it's skill that makes us doubt skill is that's the area where the confidence sort of sits and plays in and so to eliminate that you become insanely good you, and, and 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 to become insanely good means to master things and mastery sits in the detail it means to be able to work with the finest things in your game and fine tune them and be able to level up and be able to tweak and be able to adjust and be able to not let that affect your performance. So often cricketers in South Africa, while they're busy tweaking their back foot, they will have a conscious awareness of that going into performance where if they, if you can tweak your foot, like a tiny little bit. Coley spoke about this in England. You know, when he was touring England once, he's like, no, I needed to stay a little bit more side on in these English conditions. So I made sure my back foot, I turned it a bit more sideways. Steve Smith is another good example of that, about how regularly he sort of adjusts what he does. And it doesn't really seem to affect their performance that much. Where I think in South Africa, the cricketers I've certainly dealt with for a long period of time, you make a technical change and it's like their whole world wobbles. Because it's almost like my identity buys it to my technique. I am a trigger movement. No, you're not. It's just something you use that either helps you or doesn't help you. Or maybe it helps you in certain conditions or at certain times. Sashin is another great example. He never triggered the same. In India, he stood dead still. In Australia, or sometimes he triggered with his front foot until he was in. 
in Australia and South Africa triggered with his back foot. Those are like small little details that that he was able to manipulate, right? So when we can become insanely good and when we can uh, play for the love of the game and when we can have a sense of identity, I think if we can sort of have those three things more locked in, then I think we wouldn't want to show up thinking that we should prove something because we know we're good enough from an ability point of view because we just know it. It's like you can't bowl me any ball that I can't hit. There's nothing you can throw at me that's going to worry me. Okay, cool. I know who I am and I'm going to show up like that. Then I think good things. And I'm here just to enjoy this game and play with a freaking smile on my face and love everything I'm doing. Well, then I think good things happen. I think phenomenal things start coming your way. And then I think winning World Cups and things like that, it's, it's, a, it's a byproduct of, of all of that work. Yeah, that's my, that's my two cents. Um, yeah, I don't know. Russell, have you got any final thoughts maybe for this conversation? Yeah, I think we need to wrap up. Um, just one final thing. I think the, the lie is we, we, what you talk about with those three items is um, the lie is often to, to put yourself outside the present. We know that if you're in the zone, if you're in the insanely great space, you're in the now, right? And everything that's outside of now, outside the immediate, tends to be the lie, right? So, so what we have often in a narrative is this is where we are. And this over here is where we want to be. And this gap in between the two is essentially what we're trying to bridge. And we try and find all sorts of things to try and get there. That in itself is a lie. The objective is to say we are in the now. We are perfectly where we are and where we need to be. And we need to be, be as expressive of our perfection where we are currently and let that evolve. And as long as we have the perfection in the immediate and we stay there consistently, that will breed that insanely great things and whatever else that comes with it. Yeah. And really? I think we don't do that. We tend to constantly push it outside of ourselves, looking for that, that desperation. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Russell, this has been fun. Um, I think maybe let's just make everybody aware. There's a couple more conversations coming. We're going to delve into some, some different topics or a different sphere altogether. Um, stop for now. Maybe it's not quite done, the lifting the covers, but lifting the covers uh, will be on pause a little bit. And we, we, we're excited to sort of explore other parts of performance, um, in particular, maybe a little bit around teams and how, how teams in general, right, can, can level up and, and be better at what they do. Um, and I, I'm excited to sort of jump into those topics with you. I'm looking forward to it. Right. Awesome. Cool. Thanks, Russell. Cheers. Cheers.